What's up, everyone? We are super excited to be with you today. We have a very special interview. We are joined today by John from Huckleberry Hill Farms. We have a he's got a, a award winning strain. He's been uh, winning awards at the Emerald Cup. He's got amazing flower and also a really fantastic story about his legacy farm where it goes back uh, a generation back decades. So before we get into that, We've got a couple shout outs that I need to get at, get to. First off, shout out to everyone in the Cannabis community. Without you, this wouldn't be possible. We've got folks on our live stream right now. Those are folks in our members only community. So if you want to join us and be a part of these sorts of live streams and be eligible to, to win giveaways and things like that, that we do at, every, at the end of every single live stream, join us on the Cannabis app. Search Cannabis in the App Store or search uh, Cannabis on Google go to cannabuzz.app, join the community and use the code GrowersLove for 50% off your first month. And we'd super appreciate it. Also, shout outs to Grove Bags. By the time this episode goes out on YouTube, our Grove Bags episode is probably going to be out too. So definitely check out our Grove Bags episode that we just did. It's a really great deep dive. But essentially what this product is, is it's a bag to cure your weed. So it cures your weed to perfection. You dry it, throw it in a bag. They've got bags of all sorts of sizes, but pounds and pounds down to small bags and even bags that you can put in a dispensary shelf. So check them out, grovebags.com and use the code cannabis for 7% off your order. And then lastly, of course, shout out to our friend Tiki Madman for supporting the show and helping us get out to Emerald Cup this past December. So uh, make sure to hit him up at tikimadman.com and tikiseeds.com. He's got a summer sale going on right now for 20% off over at Tiki Seeds. And he's also, he's got a promo at uh, neptuneseedbank.com, right? That was a, he was doing a free pack of Grape Ape Gushers um, with the purchase of a Tiki Madman bucket hat. So, all right, so uh, check that out if you want to get some swag. But uh, And super shout out to all the folks for helping make this show possible. All right, let's get into it. So I've got some props today for this show, for this episode. Uh, I was super excited to be joined today by Johnny Casali. He is the owner-operator uh, farmer from Huckleberry Hill Farms up in Northern California. I've got his jar of uh, white thorn rose, which is his uh, strain that he's been getting all sorts of press and articles about. It's the one that you guys in the cannabis community hear me talking about all the time. Um, but uh, we've got stickers and seeds. We'll get into all that in just a second. But uh, thanks for joining us today, Johnny. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me on. I've been looking forward to this for a for longer than just uh, a little while, and uh, now we're finally here and excited to talk to you and the the listeners. Thank you. So um, we were excited to connect with you because we haven't had too many opportunities to connect with someone like you who's got such a great legacy uh, with the plant who goes back generations. And so, um, and, and you know, honestly, I love the story that you have. So if you could, um, help our listeners understand kind of your connection with the plant and how your farm came to be a farm, it's just a, a great story. And I'd love to, to take our listeners on that journey. Sure. Um, you know, I'm sitting here in the living room of the very house that I grew up on. So, um, we moved here when I was five years old, my mother, my, my uh, stepdad and I, and we really were kind of part of that back to the land movement where we wanted to create a lifestyle of our own and do it in the way we wanted to and, and not live in the city and have the nine to five job and, and just live our life a little bit different than that, which um, I'm not saying anything's wrong with that other kind of lifestyle. But we, we preferred to be out here in the nature, in the wild, in the redwoods, next to the ocean. And um, I'm surrounded by all that beautiful stuff. And, um, you know, in doing that, living in the country is, isn't easy by any means. It's uh, taking care of the roads. It's uh, miles from town. There's one or two grocery stores. And um, really, we grew most of our food in the vegetable garden. We had fruit trees. My stepdad was a, you know, a hunter. So we sometimes we'd had venison or elk meat when he would go to Oregon and 
Um, we were part-time commercial fishermen, which included crabbing, albacore, salmon. We were also were part-time loggers. And um, then we also had a small nursery that we sold, sold supplies to, um, to the local growers. So what, what we learned really quickly in the country, there wasn't one in one thing that you could do actually to, to make a living here, there was, had to be a multiple of different things. And then cannabis became part of it. And, you know, as time kept going on, um, regulations with uh, the fishing industry and the logging industry, um, started getting harder and harder and tighter. And it just wasn't feasible any, any longer to do that. So, um, we kind of got rid of, uh, crabbing and got rid of, uh, of doing logging a little bit and we just added more cannabis to our lifestyle to to make up for that income that wasn't coming in and back then I'm, I'm thinking back in we're talking early 80s you know the price was only like maybe 1200 maybe maybe a thousand twelve hundred dollars a pound we you know we were kind of new at the game and really relied on um our neighbors and friends once they accepted us into the community to kind of show us the ropes and back then we were rolling the bigger buds in between our hands trying to make them look like tie sticks and like growing cannabis like there's so many failures along the way you know but i guess that's parallel with life you know you can't just be good at growing pot and you know, some of these new corporate cannabis companies think that I can hand them over some SOP thing. And um, on Wednesdays, they can pour something in a tank and, you know, the pot will come out amazing. But, you know, from early age, what my mom taught me was that you can't buy TLC in a jug. And it really took the tender, loving care um, of each, every, each and every individual plant. Um, to make it come out amazing in the end. So, right. um, you know, and I followed her around since I was 10, growing things in the vegetable garden and growing things out here on the property. And, you know, it really took about five years of following her around, watching her, learning from her um, before I really convinced her to give me my first 10 plants uh, when I was 15 years old. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and it was pretty cool. At, at what point um, was your mom or your family kind of developing their own strains or, or at the, like, uh, could you give us kind of an understanding of what, like, what was the strain situation back then? And then at what point was your family kind of, you know, you guys had your own, you know, magic, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So initially, um, and that was a learning experience too. There was, there was plenty of years we tried to grow strains that really weren't, uh, didn't do very well here on this, uh, piece of property in this terroir and the microclimate that we have here. Um, we're located right over the mountainside from the coast. So sometimes we get fog that influences the temperature here. Um, and, and I've, I've come to believe that, you know, every different area, whether or not it's just over the ridge or, or 20 or 50 or 100 miles away, um, really takes a lot of time to discover which strains grow best there. And in doing that, you know, initially, I think we got seed from our neighbor, which, you know, he had experimented around with. So they did pretty well right here. But then part of, part of the fun begins when you start crossbreeding strains that, that I like or with my mom like with friends of ours and, and we start creating our own strains and see how well they do here. And um, so that, that really started in the early eighties that we started our own breeding program and, um, and really developing strains of our own and, you know, not to jump too far ahead, but, you know, today, even as a legal cannabis farm, I grow a strain that uh, I used to grow with my mom back when I was 10 years old. So, you can't buy that at a commercial nursery. It tastes and looks and smells different than anything that, you know, most consumers have access to. And um, it's pretty unique and special. And, and I really want people to be able to experience that kind of magic. For sure. Well, I think you brought up, I think you brought up some really uh, valuable points there for people because a lot of newcomers to growing, especially guys who try to grow in their backyard or, out in the woods or whatever, 
um, they hear all these hot strains that are out and, you know, I need Gorilla Glue this and that. And they don't realize that the microclimate that their property or their area is in is going to determine whether the genetics they're using is going to be successful or not. And so the fact that you were able to get something from your neighbor that had probably already been climatized and stuff like that was like a huge blessing to you because had you tried to grow skunk bud number one or something like that, it could have been a completely different outcome. And so I just wanted to kind of touch on that a little bit because that is a very powerful thing. And, and I try to, I try to get people to kind of wrap their heads around that issue, you know? Yeah, that's a little bit harder one to understand. And, and I don't want you, I don't want to mislead anybody to believe that I didn't have many failures. Like we had tons of failures. I had t tons of bad crops and good crops and um, really learned along the way over the last 50 years on what different techniques, which cultivars, I guess we're calling them cultivars nowadays or strains or whatever we want to call them. And, um, and really, I think what our, our best attribute here in the Emerald Triangle is that so many of this, this close community um, really shares information with one another. So some of the mistakes that my neighbor made or the guy over the ridge made, you know, he tells me, you know, hey, I don't know if you want to grow that or you, maybe you don't want to try fertilizing it with this because every different cultivar that we grow here really tech, takes its own individual um, attention and own fertilizing fertilizer that it likes and dislikes. So I'm fertilizing different cultivars on my property with different things according to over the years what I've discovered each wow. individual strain likes. That's really cool. Yeah. Well, um, I'm so stoked. We could go, we could take this interview in so many different directions right now. Um, but the direction that I'm going to choose is, um, you know, a big part of your story, Johnny, is the, um, is the war on drugs and that experience. It's a part of your, the logo that you put on your stuff. This is on the back of the shirt that I'm wearing right now too. Um, this is a helicopter. Um, and it looks like it's, it's got something at the bottom of a rope. Maybe you could kind of illuminate what is this image? Um, and can you kind of speak to what you're kind of trying to evoke here or get people to think about when people buy this jar on the show, um, you know, at their local dispensary? <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question and really kind of gives me goosebumps because um, that logo you know, I, I really struggled whether or not to put it on my jar or whether or not people would really truly understand or would it have meaning with people like it does to the farmers of the Emerald Triangle. But just a, a quick backstory of really where a multi-billion dollar industry was created um, was, was really here in the Emerald Triangle. Um, so with the war on drugs, Ronald Reagan in 1985 had declared the war on drugs and really wanted to make a point of um, eradicating cannabis and, and really getting rid of um, the people in the mountains that were growing weed. And so they had all these different agencies like Camp, Net, yeah. Comet, Green Sweep. Um, shoot, I know I'm, uh, they had Black Hawk helicopters. And the, these helicopters really flew over the different properties and did aerial surveillance and located and found weed that we were growing. And um, early on, it wasn't that bad. You know, a few of the bigger growers would get busted. But after Ronald Reagan declared the war on drugs, um, camp would usually start at the beginning of the year down in San Diego, work its way up to L.A., um, you know, then to the Santa Cruz Mountains, to Southern Mendocino, Northern Mendocino, over to Trinity County, Northern Humboldt. But really, at the end of the year, when they had to spend the last of the money that they had, because the way the federal government works is if they don't spend as much money as they were given th this year, they won't get as much next year. So whatever they had at the end of the year, they exhausted those funds here in Southern Humboldt County with eradication teams and enforcement teams. And there were times where there was four and five different helicopters in the air, dropping guys like you see on my jar down on cables and wires into gardens with nets. Then they would fly away. Their, their uh, officers would cut down all the weed, load it up into these nets 
and then the, the helicopter would come back and hook it onto a hook and then they would pull these 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 patches out of remote areas in the mountain because we could never grow out in our front yard like we do today we were we were trying to evade being detected and so there was times where we were growing underneath trees we were growing in trees on platforms it was kind of really a wild, wild west of a cat and mouse game that we were playing as a 20 year old kid, because what I had always believed and many of my friends had always believed is if you got busted growing this plant as a first time nonviolent offender, you would just get probation. You know, we are growing pot in Humboldt County, the, the world's renowned, renowned Humboldt County that that's all people do here. Most of us did. And, um, Unfortunately, my best friend and I, we were growing on a piece of property and um, my neighbor turned us in. And um, one morning here at my house, I woke up to 30 federal agents showed up here, held a nine millimeter to my head and and uh, brought me in my house for eight hours while they searched my property and um, searched the property where we were growing the pot. And at the end of the day, they left me with a little yellow speeding ticket. and. Um, that was it. They, they, they left me with this yellow speeding ticket and, and I didn't see them for another year and a half. And year and a half after that, they showed back up with an, what they call as an arrest warrant. And that means they're ready to file charges for me conspiring to grow cannabis. And um, at this point, it was a federal charge. And so the difference between being charged locally, um, where I would have probably just got probation, um, I was charged now federally, which we knew nothing about. And I was looking at a mandatory minimum as a first time non, uh, nonviolent offender uh, for growing a thousand plants for 10 years to life in prison. Um, and when I talk about a thousand plants, it seems like a lot of plants, they were probably trying to make millions of pounds and millions of dollars. But really because we were forced to grow underneath the trees, the plants only got to be like a two or three feet tall and we were getting an ounce of plant. We were trying to get 20 pounds a piece. And so we weren't trying to grow very much. They pulled 500 plants out of the bushes that were in 72 pack trays that were like two inches tall. And they really created a story that really looked pretty bad. And we, uh, we told the judge immediately that we were guilty for growing the weed we just wanted him to truly understand as first time nonviolent offenders that we would never hurt anybody. Like that's not the kind of people we were. And, and I just really truly believe that if he understood that in his heart, that there was no way we could go to jail for growing a, a plant. And, you know, he stood up in that courthouse that day of sentencing and I can re remember it so vividly. And he was really emotional and, and everybody that came here, came down to the courthouse, um, they got really emotional too. And he stood up and he said, I want nothing more than to give you no time for growing this, but because I'm bound by the law, uh, I have to uphold the law. And so he gave us the lower end of the sentencing guidelines, which was 120 months, 10 years in jail. And you have to do 85% of your time in federal prison. So me and my best friend, we were as green as you could get and we would never hurt anybody. And we did eight years in jail for this plant. And then, excuse me, and then had five years probation. So I gave up 17 years out of my life to now be able to say, ironically, that I'm permitted by the county and I'm permitted by the state of California. And so everything that we do here, I want it to have meaning. I don't want it to be about money. I want people to truly understand um, what we went through to be able to give people some of the best pot in the world. I think that's really important, and I think that that's so, so, um, so much what me and Sam are really trying to do. Because, like you said, I don't think people really realize what you folks went through and the sacrifices you made at the time uh, to provide our nation with a healing plant. And so, to be demonized and thrown in prison is one thing, but then now generations later to have your way of life being stripped away from you is the stuff that fires us up we're here to let your story be told because people need to know i mean it's all of course that helicopter is part of your origin story 
And that's very powerful. Um, but at the same time, at the end of the day, your fight is not over. You're not fighting helicopters anymore. You're fighting bureaucrats and taxation without representation. And so I want to kind of get back to the grow part. So can you talk a little bit about the cultivars you were using prior to camp showing up versus what you were using after camp showed up? Yeah, so most of the cultivars we grew here were were earlier cultivars. So we grew strains that we were able to harvest like um, the first week of September because that was really three or four weeks out of that summer month that we didn't have to be subjected to aerial surveillance because we would be harvested earlier than most people would be harvested. And in doing that, there was a limited supply back then. So harvesting earlier in September, we were able to dry it, trim it, cure it, and then get it on the, the traditional marketplace early enough where we would get two or three hundred dollars more a pound and be able to get rid of it. Um, so that was the benefit back then of those cultivars. And it always smelled good. And, you know, we didn't do any COA testing or anything. So we didn't know THC. We really just followed our nose and it smelled amazing and it made us feel amazing. And that's all we really cared about. And that's all really the buyers cared about. Yeah, it was different back then. You know, it wasn't a it wasn't thirty one flavors of of weed names. You know what I mean? It it was kind of different for some people back then. But you know, while I was in jail, and and if you know, three thousand days is a long time for somebody that never had done a day, and you have a lot of time to think. And unfortunately, my mother had passed away a year to the day that I was in there, and. You know, she had always taught me that money would never make you happy. This happy, so never pursue money because that you'll never end up with enough to make you happy. And really, it's about them, family, friends, and community. And it was this community that really stood up for me and really supported me. And even when I showed up at home after being gone for that long, I had fifty people here from this community. So I really dedicated. Um, really what I was doing here on the farm as a legal permitted farm um, to my mother. And I wanted to uphold her legacy and what she had taught me. So we're still growing her strain here on the farm. And all the strains that we grow here are actually a hybrid of strains that we've bred here, created by breeding to her strain that uh, she used to grow with me when I was 10. So there's a little bit of her in everything that I do. And the farm is a little different than most farms with flowers and Buddhas and sound healing and wish boxes and really want to be able to touch people and, and really let them know that um, when something's not about the money and the motivation really is about healing people and about the medicine of the plant and about that connection, about sharing something that we've never been able to share with people before, um, that connection with the consumer and your listeners is really what's valuable to most of the farmers in the Emerald Triangle. Can you For speak sure. a little bit to, to how the plant provides? I mean, because you've kind of stated that over your <laughs> lifetime, and it's certainly been true in my lifetime. Can you talk a little bit about how the plant provides? Provides as... as uh, Medicine, uh, well, so income, you know, in medicine, <laughs> income, therapy you know, a way to develop your property, your soil. I mean, it provides in, for people in our lifestyle, it provides in every way. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. In this community, it's really built this community. You know, it was through our donations and through the generosity of most of the farmers that built the the Emerald Triangle, that built the volunteer fire departments, the schools that are located in the mountains, um, you know, all the technical rescue teams. It was all of our donations and our, our generosity. They built a little world of our own that was really unlike any other place that I had been to. And um, it, 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 it's really special. It's really struggling now. And it's ironic that at the end of the day where we're at now with the industry is we're really relying on the consumer to support the, the small farmer to to go ask for some of these strains that 
that we're growing and cultivating because unless they go to the retail shop and ask for it, you know, it, it's really easy for the retailer to say, look, we're going to go buy this strain from X company that's that's five dollars less a jar because they, right. they're growing five point five million square feet where I'm growing five thousand square feet. And it's just rows, my girlfriend and I that are touching every single plant and touching every single leaf. Um, it's just a little bit different product. I'm not saying there's not a, a place in the market for that other stuff, but I really want people to understand what makes me feel good might not make you feel good. So if you ever run across somebody that says I grow the best weed in the world, that's your first red flag because that <laughs> might not be what it, <laughs> that might mm -hmm. not be what leads you to having your best and most amazing experience. You have to really, um, and I always tell people the most important thing to know and to ask the retailer when you're going into the store is know your farmer, ask how they're cultivating your cannabis, ask what kind of groups they support. Do they donate to Sweet Leaf Joe, Compassionate Care Groups, the veterans? Um, because once you can discover and, and understand how I'm cultivating, who I am inside, what kind of person I am. Um, if you deem that I'm a pretty good person, then probably the cannabis that you're about to put in your pot, your body is probably pretty good for you. And so what it's up to you at this point is to find out what cannabinoid and what terpene and how much THC will actually affect you in the most positive way. And I can't tell you that each individual has to experiment around and learn for themselves. So there is work that needs to be done. For sure. Well, J Johnny, I want to get into your strains. I'm really excited. Um, we also we had a question that came in on uh, chat that kind of teased this that. up. So the the chat, um, uh, James uh, James Cannabis from our community, he said he's not a breeder, right, or just a producer. And I said, he's both. So um, <laughs> actually, so this was a really exciting development for me recently that Johnny just came out with these seeds. These are uh, Huckleberry Hill Farms. Uh, it's a pack of 20 seeds, Paradise Pine. This is uh, Paradise Punch times White Thorn Rose. You can get this right now at tangledrootsstore.com. Make sure to check that out. You can get uh, Johnny's Farm and a bunch of other farms like in his neck of the woods, I believe, uh, some other uh, friends of his. So check out tangledrootsstore.com. And then while you're also just like looking for want to know more about uh, Johnny and, and maybe uh, read some stuff while you're listening to this interview, hit up his website at pickhumboldt.com uh, for Huckleberry Hill Farms. But yeah, let's get into it, Johnny. So you were talking about the strains that uh, you grow and that you've been kind of putting together and your, your mom's strain. So let's start it out with that one in particular, because that one seems like what everything's kind of built around or at least some things are built off of. So uh, let's start out with that one. What is that strain? And yeah, give us the backstory. So absolutely. Yeah. Paradise Punch, um, formerly known as Fruit Loops, um, was a strain that my mom developed here, you know, early on the early 80s. Um, she took a, a, a blueberry kush and she she uh, she I think that was a male plant and we bred it to my one of my best friend's mother's plant, um, a lavender kush. And we came up Ooh. with this fruit loop strain, which we now call paradise punch. And like, uh, I was telling JR before it was a, a strain that grew really well here on the property. And it was a very early harvester, you know, some, somewhere in between September 1st and September 7th. And so it really made it, um, uh, it, it, it made it possible for us to really harvest it early and get it out into the marketplace. And so, you know, breeding as, as a farmer breeding uh, is really one of my favorite things to do. It's always looking for um, the new unicorn that's out there and, and discovering new combinations and hybrids and stuff. And so really from early on and even more so today, I've been, uh, breeding back to Paradise Punch now with um, all kinds of different cultivars, even OG and um, uh, just any kind of different uh, plant that comes along. I end up breeding it with Paradise Punch. And it really takes several years before you can actually breed it, grow it, 
and then discover whether or not you like it or not. And, oh, interesting. And, you know, um, yeah. So it takes several years. So to answer your friend's question or your listener's question is, yeah, I'm like addicted to breeding. And <laughs> my greenhouse awesome. right now has like four or five different experiments going on that I'm super excited about. And this, you know, from popular demand, the Paradise Punch White Thorn Rose, which we call uh, Paradise Pine that you're, you're holding, Sam, was the first time we really released it, but we haven't actually grown it. But um, the White Thorn Rose has won a lot of Emerald Cups with its live rosin and um, bubble hash and, um, and even in some of the flowers. So, uh, you know, I can't imagine that there's not going to be the next winner in that box of 20 that you're holding um, and I'm pretty excited. I'm growing those and really have to discover there'll probably be several different phenotypes that are in there. Sure. I really look forward to growing um, along with the people that have purchased those seeds and really pheno hunting them together and finding the best of the best for, for whatever reasons we think. So that's so sick. That's really cool. I'm yeah, I've got three right now. I'm going to get the, um, sex test results from our friend, farmer Freeman. I'm going to get those results. Uh, looks like tomorrow in my email. So I'll be like refreshing constantly <laughs> to see if, uh, you know, how many, uh, females I got. Um, but I'll be growing those outside. Um, so yeah, you've been you've been hitting Paradise Punch with a lot of different things. What does Paradise Punch bring to the party? So you're you're the mad scientist back there. I love this image in my mind that I've got. You're this like breeder mad scientist back there. What do you find uh, Paradise Punch is bringing to the party when you're when you kind of combine it? Uh, Paradise Punch is a very fruity. Um, aromatic strain that really to me just reminds me of my childhood and, and um, reminds a lot of people that consume it about um, some of those earlier strains that used to be around like the blueberries and the, the lab berries. And um, it's the reason I really started breeding with it was because no matter what strain I bred it to some of those late October strains um, some of the, you know, the OGs were usually the first week or second week of October. And whenever I breed those strains into the Paradise Prunch, it always made those new strains now two to three weeks earlier. So it was my way of really taking a super late, high THC, high terpene um, strain and really making it early. Because what we always wow. fight here is... Um, and which was always scary and really a big benefit of growing the Paradise Punch back then was the early rainstorms that we would get here in Northern California. And I think like JR experiences in, in Oregon, yeah. um, it can devastate a crop. So really, <laughs> you know, getting out a couple weeks earlier, especially mid September, really kind of hedges your bet on the amount of risk you're taking over the course of the year. So most people don't grow sour diesel outside anymore or I don't think anybody grows sour diesel anymore at all. But um, <laughs> back when that was a thing, um, and I heard it's making a comeback, I think it is. that, you know, that was a late October. So if, if you got two, three, four, five inches of rain, it would devastate your crop. So you spent seven months out of the year growing this plant, and all of a sudden you lose it the last two or three weeks. So totally. um, that was the biggest reason in the uh, we, always, we always bred to the Paradise Punch. I was going to give, uh, sorry, JR. I was real quick, J. Uh, I was going to give our friend uh, Soul Spirit Farms, because I know you're buddies with them. They grow the sour diesel. So I wanted to give Walter uh, a shout out because uh, he's holding it down up there. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Walter, JR. Walter and Judy are two another amazing farmers uh, in Willow Creek. And last year they did grow the uh, sour diesel, I think the headband, some OGs. Yeah. They really wanted to get back to the roots and really um, there, there started to be an up uptick in demand for some of those older flavors. And, and people are getting tired of the ice cream cakes and the gelatos and all these hype strains that maybe for a minute took center stage, but now are, are falling back and people are really looking for some of the, the green clack, the green cracks, the blue dreams and some of those old flavors that really made them feel amazing. The point I was going to make is um, a lot of a lot of times now farms are coming online and they're kind of 
trying to get things put together genetic wise and they're paying breeders to breed for them so that they can have a strain proprietary to their farm or whatever. Well, you've taken that completely out of the equation. And like I said, you've kind of built it into your origin story. So from a branding perspective, and I know branding may not be super important to you, but from a branding perspective, that's a very powerful thing. Well, and you know, JR, you hit on it in a point that I'm really surprised hasn't happened yet. Um, I'm surprised like a, uh, in, you know, cookies is poking around up here. I know he works with my friend Ridgeline Farms and he's, you know, he's licensed a strain called Lance. Um, and there's a few other people, but, you know, I, I'm waiting for the, the Derek Jeter's of the world to, to come to a Huckleberry Hill Farms and say, hey, why don't you breed a strain specifically to me that nobody else in the world has? And, you know, it, it's gaining attention, you know, like the white thorn rose. It can only be found here at this farm. It's the, it's a strain that we created to the Paradise Punch that um, I've kind of covered it and hogged a little bit to, to ourselves <laughs> because we had a really hard time as a small farmer competing with all these, you know, big industrial size grows. And <laughs> so to eliminate the oversupply problem that California has, we just, you know, went back to our roots and are growing our legacy strains or creating strains that resonates with people that nobody else in the world have. And we've gotten away from the oversupply problem by doing that. And as long as people like them, you know, we're going to continue to grow. them. And that's what I think is so brilliant about you, because I think uh, I was going to step on you earlier because I, I was going to say that, Johnny, I think you actually you are you're totally into branding and that's in a, in a, in a smart way. Because it's, um, we talked about this when I first met you over a year ago, that your story is a part of your brand. You've been out there a lot in the past year. I was going to, you know, earlier, I just want to, you know, thank you because you've been on like 60 minutes. You've been all over the place in the past year telling your story, telling the community story so that people can understand what's going on in Northern California and in the cannabis industry. Um, but it's just... Um, you you've done a great job of building up your brand and specifically with white thorn rose i so we'll have we definitely should get into white thorn rose um i don't i think it's so totally smart of you guys to have this strain of yours and to keep hold of it and not give it out there because it it's crucial like you just said for you guys to have you know uh, something that is yours and and no one else has because yeah, if it got out there, then yeah, there could be, I could get, you know, $100 ounces or whatever of this, what people would call white thorn rose, but it's not the actual flower, you know, it'd be like a bastardization of this amazing strain, this amazing flower that you guys have. Um, so I just, I, I think it's as a business person and as someone who's building a company, I really think it was smart that you guys, you can have your own strains and then you can, you can listen to the crazy fans like me that are like beating down your door, like, dude, I got to get a hold of that strain. <laughs> and you created like a little offshoot so I can like still kind of like dabble in it, get something that's kind of close, but still, I'm going to still have to come back to you and, you know, buy the flower that I love. So I just, I just wanted to put that out there. I think it's really smart how you've been doing that, this, um, and the great imagery that you create around your brand. It's all really smart. Um, let me stop you there for one second, if I might. And, and you said a bunch of things in there that, you know, I, I'll have to disagree with a little bit because, I'm really just a farmer and the reason you and I get along so well and we, we, we just have this thing about us, or at least I feel like we have this connection is because you love weed so much. And I love talking with people that love this plant because this is all I've ever done in my whole life. And this is, this is my legacy. And it's like a cabinet maker making beautiful cabinets. And I've, I've held it in for 40 years and I could never share it with anybody and I could never tell anybody about it. And we were always carpenters when we went to school because we could always get in trouble for it or we could get our parents in trouble. So this is the first time in my life that I've gotten to share this with somebody. And I really enjoy interacting with people that really love this plant and really understand that we're not doing it for money. I don't know how to run a business. I'm not a marketer or branding brander. It feels really selfish of me not to give white thorn rose out. So I had to, 
you know, kind of bust out and make myself feel good and do the paradise punch to white thorn rose, which could possibly have something better than the white thorn rose. Cause white thorn rose will be here for a minute. And then there will be something that takes it. But you might hold in your hands today, something that's the next best of the best. And that's the truth of the matter. And I think yeah. a cool thing that you've done is you've made connections with the people that you're giving your genetics to. Um, I have a friend who's a breeder and I gifted him a pheno that I found of his work. And now we're able to share it with the community. He can use it to breed with. And so having that connection with your, the people that you share your genetics with your new crosses, uh, that's a powerful thing for them and also for you. Yeah. And, you know, I can feel it when I, when I meet people and, you know, I just, I just recently had a firefighter from San Mateo send me a huge gift box. And whenever he goes into a retail shop and he finds the white thorn rose, he buys as many jars as he possibly can. And, That's so cool. you know, he kind of gets it. He's watched a lot of our videos. He sees the passion. He understands that, you know, he found somebody that's very passionate about what they do and that I care about how the product that I'm putting on the marketplace makes you feel. It, it matters to me. And I've had some people reach out and say, maybe the jar they got maybe wasn't the best. And I've always done whatever I can to, to make it right. Cause there'll be some of those jars and everything that you, you experience. And so um, it's about developing relationships and, and um, the big reason why I got a tourism license, one of only three in Humboldt County is to share our legacy and the specialty of all the, uh, the small craft sun grown farmers in the Emerald Triangle. That's so cool. Well, let's, yeah, it's um, you know, as the white thorn rose fanboy on this uh, on this show, I got to ask you some questions about white thorn rose. So, what was it like? What was it like when you made white thorn rose? And then tell us the aha moment. Like, what, what was it when you smoked it? When you're like, "Holy shit, this is the one," or whatever. Like, I just want to hear because it's so. I've been having fun as just a fan of it, watching it. The like, I feel like the White Thorn Rose is this like snowball that's building, and I've been watching it build just over the last like year and a half that I've known you and first smoked it at uh, Emerald Cup, and uh, even just in that time, I feel like I'm watching the story evolve and change. So I want to hear the origin story. Tell me all about it. So it was about one inch from getting cold out of my my pheno hunts and just let go and lost forever uh really um i had crossed paradise punch with lemon og and back uh early in in legalization in 2017 2018 a lot of us farmers were growing from seeds until the marketplace pushed back and said look if you're calling it x strain it all has to look identical so that kind of forced a lot of us to start growing from clones. So at least if it was white thorn rose, it would look the same as what I was calling it. But, um, you know, we all still grow from seed. And back then, um, the paradise punch to lemon OG was on the farm. There was three or four different phenos out there. And, you know, I was evaluating the, the hybrid that it created. And I was kind of hemming and hawing about it. It smelled amazing. But, you know, back in our mind, we were always still growing a little bit, not only for THC, but we were also growing a little bit for structure and how heavy is it? Do the trimmers like to trim it? And white thorn rose isn't any of those things. White thorn rose was purple, which back in 2017, it wasn't about purple, or at least that purple. And um, it was, you know, a mid to lower 20% THC. And it, uh, the structure is a little weird because there's no, no way to really trim it and get rid of the bottom stem or else you would just trim it to nothing. And so you have to be okay with there being a little bit of stem. So aesthetically, it didn't look like that rock hard indoor OG that people were kind of comparing to the best of the best. but to me, it, it was a reminder of my childhood and when Heritage asked to extract it and it won the Emerald Cup for Bubble Hash in second place in Rosin, it really took the life of its own and put it in my own jars and people started smoking it and really started making people feel amazing. 
And it wasn't until years later that I did a study with Columbia University because I was so disappointed. You know, Whitethorn Rose was getting a California COA test and it was coming back as like 1.5% church, 1.5. And, you know, you, you kind of like to brag when it's in the twos or threes or fours even, but it smelled so amazing. I had a hard time believing that that's what it was. And it wasn't until I met a chemist at a Columbia University that took White Thorn Rose, fell in love with it, took it back to the lab and um, did his own study and found out that uh, White Thorn Rose has one of the rarest terpenes known to to the world, which is Selena Dying. And it's not even tested in California. So therefore it was getting all these lower test scores or lower terpene scores because the California labs don't even test for the terpenes that oh. white thorn rose has in it. So I don't enter the state fair because I can't win with white thorn rose because the labs don't test for those terpenes. So oh. a lot, what we're learning is a lot of these legacy strains up here have terpenes that are outside of the scope of the California testing labs and Hence, the first lab to really start testing for all the terpenes will dominate the sun grown category. So wow, that's, that's my piece to the labs is get on the ball. But um, long story short, to answer your question, Whitethorn Rhodes is now our farm favorite. It's very unique. It's, it's part of my story. And it's, uh, it's, it's a very special cultivar that someday, yes, I will release it to the world. Um, but it's after I, you know, hunt the paradise pine and find something that might be just a little bit different or better. Fair enough. Um, so, you know, uh, obviously uh, we have uh, people that are going to be watching this or listening to this all over the world. So, um, you know, they're going to have to come to California and try it out for themselves. Um, but to kind of try to communicate to folks why I love this flower so much. For me, it's... Um, the taste uh and the and the scent and the or the smell those two things come together and you know i've said this recently on podcasts and we always love to say one of our friends uh he has a a slogan that good weed should taste good um and you know yeah. your weed tastes great and it smell it tastes like it smells and that's one of the great things about your strain and obviously there's um, a lot of great strains out there, but not all of them really taste that great, or maybe they don't necessarily taste like they smell. And that's one of the things I love about White Thorn Rose is you can crack open a jar and smell it, and then maybe I get a pre-roll from you, or maybe I roll up my own joint or a bowl or whatever it is, and then that taste comes through. Can you kind of speak to that? Because um, at the very least, you know, there are a lot of growers that are are watching too. So I was curious too if you had any thoughts on what's your kind of grower magic that goes into that, that makes sure that that, you know, that taste comes through along with that smell. You know, we're still kind of cultivating in the same ways that I cultivated, you know, back when I was 10 years old. And it's, it's about really um, using a lot of this stuff from the forest and from the land. Um, I'm really big on top dressing with, you know, back guanos and Dr. Earth 444 and, you know, all organic stuff. And, and really, it, it's really the timing of fertilizing um, white thorn rose and don't want to give it too much or don't want to give it too little. And um, it's about being able to read that plant. And, and I'm learning about it more and more every year that I grow it. And I think I'm just, you know, fine tuning, um, figuring out ways to, to make it express itself better and better. And, you know, my girlfriend describes it as, as kind of like a grapefruit fruit or a strawberry oatmeal smell um and you know it's it's the one that we smoke here at the farm a lot it's it, it's not like overpowering where it drops you and puts you on the couch it's more like you want to go out and do something fun and it puts a smile on your face and um yeah that's when you'll find me when i smoke the white thorn rose or you'll find me on this i sneak a little live in there from time to time and i'll do the walks through the farm and take people through the farm because I really want them to, to, to see the magic and feel the magic. And I always tell people to really truly understand this plant um, and to feel the magic is it's about growing your own and starting it from seed and growing it through the life cycle and then harvesting it and drying it. And then being able to share it with some of your closest friend and watching it put a smile on their face. That that's the gratitude we get and you'll get from 
from growing your own. And that's what feels really good to me. And that's the reason behind what we do. I want to talk a little bit about, first, I want to hit on the structure of the flower that you described. Uh, the, the amount of crystals available in a structure like that is what makes those hash makers go crazy. Absolutely. They don't, you know, they don't want that. They want surface area of trichomes. You know what I mean? And for you to offer terpenes that maybe they can't even get anywhere else is giving them a flavor perspective and giving them an advantage and something that, you know, I could see would be really appealing. It could also speak to the why that the white, th uh, white thorn rose is so successful is because people can taste what they smell. And like Sam said, I've been wondering about that and I've been asking questions about that. So as you've been breeding all over these years and you're pheno hunting your projects, are you finding that you find phenols that taste like they smell often, or is it pretty rare that you find something that tastes exactly like it smells? You know, I've actually heard people say that, Sam, but I actually don't know if I heard them say that and really understood that, you know, now thinking about it after you bring that up, JR, there's not many strains that I have here that do taste like they smell. And um, I think white thorn rose, because so, so back to Sam's original question. So along with white thorn rose being discovered in that paradise punch to lemon OG cross, we also pulled out of that um, a strain we call mom's weed, which was the same identical cross started from the same seeds, but just different phenos. And it doesn't look the same. It's not purple. It does some have some undertone hues of purple, and it does have some little flavors of, of similar to white thorn rose, but it doesn't smell and taste the same. Yeah, it's totally all. different. It's totally different. It's yeah. different for sure. And it's the way different. It's the same. Um, but now that you say that, white thorn rose does smell like it tastes, and, it, and it's unique, and the hash makers really... Uh, resonate with it like you said jr because it's a little looser and it, it's really what what's happened and i really i'm really happy that it's happened is that I've, I've gained a little bit of trust and belief with the consumer base that now it's really about they want to try whatever i put in my jar um, yeah. so they trusted me enough to put white thorn rose even though it's not the typical rock hard round 75% THC looking bud that they, they, they expect to see. It's a little bit different, but they believe that I'm going to put something in my jar that I think will be amazing. And that I really feel like I want them to try. And so that relationship is happening now, which is really cool because it's really freed me up to express myself even furthermore and try things like the paradise pine and to, to, to really take it to another level and discover something amazing. So as you have these individual projects, um, what are your allocated pheno hunt sizes for the selections that you're making? Dude, you don't even ask me those complicated questions. I'm a wreck <laughs> over here. Like, I'm a mess. I'm juggling plants. I'm going, okay, I got four <laughs> paradise pine over here. Like, I'm the most disorganized, but the most organized and the, the hardest on myself. I got feminized projects going. Like my place looks, a there's plants. Don't move those plants. Don't touch them. This, this <laughs> coat, it's like, it's, it's really unorganized, but very organized. And I'm so excited. This year is going to be an amazing Fino hunt. Um, really most happy about that because what we did a little bit differently this year with the, the higher demand in, in from consumers for the white thorn rose, we decided to really develop this place more like a winery and and really want to be able to market and brand it that this farm is the the farm of white thorn rose and it's a different it's a cultivar that's only being cultivated here in this terroir in this part of southern humboldt just kind of like wineries do with different varietals of grape that grow in napa valley we, we want to create it like that and be able to give people tours and really to share that story and see where that what doors that opens and um how long people really love white thorn rose and if it's something that will be around here forever um this emerald cup will be big 
There's a lot of white thorn rose products, whether or not it's vape pens or hash or rosin or hash holes or all the new little things that people uh, are coming up with. White thorn rose is intermixed in a lot of that. So I'm really super excited to, to see how it fares next week. Um, did a pre-roll oh, wow. cross with Canna Country 26 in white thorn rose. We blended those two together as flower. And we entered that in there because Canada Country has a pretty unique cultivar too with the 26 that yeah. is really super high in osamine. Yeah, it um I tried both, uh, or obviously I've tried White Thorn Rose, but I tried uh that other strain too. Um it reminded me um a bit of uh forbidden fruit. Uh folks have heard me on this podcast before talk about how that's one of my favorite strains, but Forbidden fruit uh, is kind of hit or miss because sometimes the taste doesn't really come through um, and all this sort of stuff. So I felt um, and for a long time that was my favorite strain. And then when I discovered White Thorn Rose, it kind of took the throne. And I think it's because it just has such a great taste that really does come through. You can taste it right when you put the joint to your mouth before you even light it up. You can you can have that that taste comes through. Um, and then before we go, because I know we're we're coming up on an hour, I did want to give a shout out to on the on the hash side because we didn't um, we kind of glossed over it a little bit. Um, Heritage Mendocino, if uh, folks haven't aren't familiar already, uh, Google them. Uh, they are kicking ass and taking names up there. Kyle and the team up in Ukiah. They have built a really cool building there. It's a uh, dispensary that is also uh, where they make their hash. And so this is a team that has studied under Frenchie Cannoli, and they're making award-winning products. So, um, Johnny, if you could maybe talk about that a little bit, just to give people an understanding. Like, it's not just like some random people are making some great hash like this is some world-class stuff and it's also done in an environment where if you want to and if you're up in NorCal anytime you can actually go to uh Ukiah you can go to Heritage Mendocino and you can see them like working on it behind glass kind of <laughs> it's pretty cool and, and what's really cool about that Sam um you know Heritage um actually was one uh, it was the the hash makers that really smoked it bell the Brianist and and their team um and they actually seeked it out um here and wanted to come to my farm and see what it looked like growing and actually pursued it and then came here that year and actually harvested and fresh frozen it with me here on the farm and now have made it a tradition the last few years to it's harvest time. They come up here and they harvest though, you know, so you got bell and all these people that worked under Frenchie cannoli that are here teaching me about hash and how to make the best uh, fresh frozen possible and when to harvest it and when to take it and um, doing test samples of other strains like white thorn rose, uh, excuse me, mom's weed, which is going to be released uh, as a hash product here on mother's day. Oh. Um, so that team is amazing, but, I want to make a point of telling you guys to come here during harvest time because white thorn rose, the smell of it really takes over the whole valley that I live in. And this whole place is kind of rancid with white thorn rose smell <laughs> after a while. It's just like it, it actually when I harvest it, it actually permeates into my skin and it just my clothes and every after a while it's smelling, you know, strawberry oatmeal and, and grapefruit it just gets like ah i gotta get away from here <laughs> that's funny so is yeah. this so are we talking like august early september September 15th every year all right i'm gonna have to find a way to get out there in early september or be uh, or before then you should you should make a point to come into the farm oh yeah for sure well um this has been such a great time i really um such a heart touching story johnny there at the beginning um and really have had such a blast um hearing everything from you today um i'm gonna hit you with one last question from the chat uh before we go because I, I thought this is a great question this comes from our buddy up in canada this is a uh, canna bridge he had a question for you he said um are there any tips that you have for uh farmers that are just getting started yeah, you know, it's uh, you should follow some of the regenerative farming community 
um, in the Emerald Triangle and feel free to ask them questions, DM them, and they can really help you out with your unique area that you're at and really try to help you identify what strain or cultivar might be best in your area to grow. And um, yeah, I think that's the best way because it, it's hard. It's not going to be about buying something in a jug. It's going to be about you need to spend time with with those plants and, and you'll make some mistakes and you'll learn some hard lessons, but you'll get better and you're better. And um, just by answering, asking that question, I can tell that person really cares. And that's the first beginning stage of an amazing farmer. And uh, JR, do you, I'll give you uh, one last question. If you had one on the, on the top of your head. Of course I do. I want everyone um, to hear about your experience with David Crosby. Uh, it means a lot to me. My father was a huge fan. And so it was the music of my childhood. And can you kind of talk about what an honor that was and what it was like having such a legend to, you know, the West Coast come and be a part of your farm? Yeah, you know, there's been quite a few different uh, legends that have come up here. Ricky Williams came to my farm. Um, and, you know, when we got the call, Ridgeline, actually, his dad um, somehow had some kind of relation with uh, Cosby and um, Jason called me and said, Hey, we're going to go have breakfast with, with Cosby. And I was like, Whoa, what's up? And he said, yeah, he has something in the works. And so, um, we went to breakfast at the Woodrose and he started, uh, David started telling us about his idea of this, this brand that he wanted to create by coming to all the legacy farmers and getting like five or 10 of the biggest buds that we had here on our farm and putting them and selling them singly in a glass jar and no matter what i was trying to tell him david that's not it can't work you know compliance wise like how do you do that and co it he's like don't you ever tell me that's not going to work we're going to do it it's going to be successful and it's going to be amazing and i said you damn right it is david <laughs> and so he really saw something and I gained a lot of respect um, for him right off the bat because um, he saw the value that the, the small farmer really brought to the industry and he wanted to be part of that. He really loved our stories. He loved how passionate we were, um, similar to the way he was passionate about music. And um, in that way, we were very much alike and um, I had the utmost respect for him. And, you know, we'll all end up in the same place together and get to, to laugh on how this whole thing turns out. So that was the story for me and my relationship with David and uh, utmost respect and, and God bless him. Yeah, what a blessing. Uh, so now as this season is coming and you're going to get to the end and we're going to come hang out, uh, what are the flavors uh, this year that you're going to be offering to the folks uh, who come and try your flower? and come see what a beautiful oasis you have. So um, we're gonna grow 90% white thorn rose on the farm this year. I'm gonna grow 15 pounds of mom's weed to stick in my own jar and that's all that'll be offered to the public. I'll have 15 pounds of Amalfi. And then we're also gonna grow in the late run a strain called Riddles, which was was um, developed last year. We crossed, um, we crossed the white thorn rose with Skittles and we came up with riddles and the hash makers seem to love that too. One first place in the ego class in Mendocino Ooh. this year, wow. which wow. Um, being a naive hash guy, didn't know what that was, but was later found out <laughs> it was something pretty damn something to be proud of and um, absolutely really have um that's going to be a big part of our our crop this year too is the riddles uh for that's the hack all we want it yeah one realize. of our recurring guests uh his name is Mushmouth. his dad uh had the uh um homegrown natural wonders uh seat uh brand under tga but he also competed at that event at ego clash and he's going to be coming on and kind of teaching people the process of how he uh, makes his, you know, competition level uh, uh, rosin. You know, I would just a quick, quick little thing, Sam, and then you can get me off here. But 
um, what, what Bell and Nick T and some of the other famous hash makers really shared with me was similar to growing a plant and really giving that tender, loving care to, in order to make it come out amazing is, is something that a hash maker has to do also. You can't just look for the most amazing flower and then think your hash is going to come out amazing. Yeah. It really takes a, a, a special art, a special technique and a touch to, to do those little things that really make the difference is how it was explained to me. Yeah. Yeah. And so just real quick, Sam, sorry. I oh, no, we're forever. good. We're good. I'm not. We can we can go long. I, I was just saying in chat, they're like, if he if they go long, they're having a good time. No. Yeah. We, we go long when the guest, uh, you know, wants to. So it's all good. Yeah. Go ahead, JR. So, yeah, one of the things that I've been learning is that the terpene profile in the flower has kind of like a peak moment. And or later in certain stages, different terpenes will be more dominant than others. Can you talk about maybe where the white thorn rose kind of falls into your seasonality of when you think it's at its peak terpene level? When I think it's at my, at least for the flower, for the jar, which I think can be a little bit different than yes. for wanting it for hash. Um, is a little bit, I, I usually wait a little bit longer when I harvest it. Um, and that's usually around September 15th, September 20th at the latest. But um, what I found through with Bell and the Bryanist and Heritage and uh, Rosin Tech and those guys, they wanted a, about a week earlier than that yep. when maybe maybe a third of the, the trichomes are amber, not so much. Maybe I let 75% of them go when um, you know, and, and that's all technical talk because, you know, I just go out there and I just can't stand it and I want to get it down. And sometimes <laughs> sometimes we see, oh, there's a big storm coming in, in a couple mm -hmm. of days. And yeah. so that kind of plays in when to, we're going to harvest, too. So there's more than just when is it done? We have to figure in the weather and all that stuff, too. So are you guys going out there with like a microscope? Like I have one of these like US like Bluetooth microscope things that I hook up to my phone. I was always curious how you guys do it. You know, I, I'm, yeah, I don't, I, you know, I should, I guess that would get me a little closer to where I need to be, but I just go out there and I just, that's, I just know. You have I your just, Jedi I don't know. skills. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I sound stupid when I'm saying that. No. But I just know that that's it. And, and I don't, you know, I just wait for those pods to really swell up. And it it's just so pungent. I just, just say, that's it. We're doing it tomorrow. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> sorry, sorry for it. I wish it was a little higher tech around here, but no, it's I love pretty it. low. So, so when do you put your plants outside? Have you already put your plants outside? We're recording this right mm -hmm. now on May 8th. Yeah, so, so I... I can't put my plants out um, because I grow from clone. I can't put them out until like the first week of June because they're such early finishers. You got to be really aware as a grower that the earlier uh, finishers will really tend to go into flowering stage if you put them out too early in the beginning of the year. So the earlier they finish, probably the later you really have to plant them. So because White Thorn Rose and Paradise Punch and those strains harvest mid-September, early September, I don't put them out until June 1st to make sure they don't trigger into a false flower and then it just kind of screws you all up. So yeah, um, they there. still end up being three, <laughs> three, four pound plants and I don't like anything too big. Like I said, it's just Rose and I, so it, it's manageable when they're you know, six to eight foot tall. And I don't yeah, know, they're big. they look cool when they're 15 foot tall, but you know, they're, they're hard. And if it rains, it, it creates a whole bunch more problems. So. Oh, totally. And and you guys are growing in, um, are these growing in, they're like big pots, right? Or can you kind of speak to, well, we're going to get a little grow nerdy, if you will. Um, are you growing in big raised beds and pots? Like what's your situation? So in the greenhouses, we grow in raised beds. And then outside, I was fortunate enough uh, as a, a tourism farm and, and one of the earlier farms to get permitted, the county allowed me not to put them in rows in one garden area. I was able to arrange my planter boxes kind of and create a trail. So when I take people on the farm, 
we're walking in a trail of white thorn rose and it's leading you to the top of the farm. Um, so it's, it's a relatively small pot, you know, the things get root bound, but I think that actually makes them harvest a little earlier. So I think they're, they're kind of like, uh, the amount of soil is like a hundred, maybe 120 gallons. Um, but you know, they're also have to share space with, uh, the petunias and the flowers that we plant alongside the plants. First of all, I want to say I love that a small pot to use 120 gallons and a small plant to use eight feet tall. So that's awesome. Uh, so yeah. what, kind, what kind of soil uh, uh, resources do you have where you are? Are you amending and making your own compost? Um, can you kind of speak to how your soil regimen uh, comes about without maybe giving away too many secrets? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I... I... I, I wish I could give too many secrets. I just, um, if there was something that was like an SOP, I, I would love to share it, but it's more of, I go get a bunch of maple leaves or a bunch of this year, the ginkgo tree was just dropping leaves everywhere. I, I collected all those. I put them on um, a bunch of cow manure and add a bunch of straw or hay and kind of have a big, huge compost pile, which I add to my existing soil. And the soil that's been in my planter boxes or my raised beds, it's been there for the last 10 years. And so like, I, I don't buy, I, I try not to buy soil at the store because you can't buy anything as good as that I already have here on the farm. And Those growing, are the best facts. growing organically and regenerative, you start to learn that and you might have to tweak it from one year to the next. And we do do soil tests with companies just to, just kind of see where we're at at the start of the year, how depleted or or how how much nutrients still left in the in the soil from the year before. So and then we plant cover crops and, you know, we do all that fun stuff that uh, slowly releases nitrogen throughout the summer months into the soil, too. So um, what kind of, what kind of top dressing are you doing and and what times are you top dressing and what are you giving them? You know, as I read the plant and I can see you know, the coloration of, of the plants changing and needing more nitrogen. I really, really love um, like 931 back guano. I really, that's my go-to um, Aurora back guano, this, the brand. Um, you know, then I, I do mix in some fish emulsion here or there and um, a lot of 444 um, Dr. Earth and, you know, just stuff like that. Just little things like that. Nothing, nothing too major. I think a lot of times less is more. It's kind of a weed. You you end up finding yourself in a lot more troubles when you're trying to overdo it and really juice them up. When you go, I'm going to give it this extra scoop. Oh God, you just you just messed up. Um, totally. So all your terpenes. Yeah, you've just destroyed all your terpenes. Yeah. So right? it's, uh, you know, less is more and and slow to go. Um, and just kind of feeling it out and getting tuned into the different cultivars that you're growing. So it's hard to say, tell somebody, yeah, I you, use this on your plants because I might not have grown those cultivars that they're growing. So I'm not sure how they'll actually react to the, to what I'm doing here on the farm. Can you talk a little bit about your experience of planting right into mother earth and the results you get from your white thorn rose, maybe as to being in a planter box? scary um unfortunately here uh, on the farm until this last year we hadn't had a whole lot of rain so the gophers and the voles in those ground rodents really have really hindered growing directly in the ground with at least having some kind of wire netting around to protect the the roots or otherwise they just go and they'll just destroy your plants it's it's pretty brutal so that's hence where i i put everything in either raised beds or these big planter boxes and i have wire they're connected all to the ground and stuff but you know they're separated from the earth with a uh, half inch wire screen to to really keep those rodents out nice and um my last question that i have on this grow topic is um is on the IPM side of things. Cause that's what I, I struggle with as I've been growing 
Um, I've only been growing outside now, I guess this might be like my fifth year. I can't remember. Um, but every year I learn something new. I learn, I deal with a new bug or a new mold or whatever it is. And, uh, so like last year when we, in California, we randomly got rain in October, which we don't typically, at least here in the Bay area. So I had mold all of a sudden. So just like things like that, you know, you just learn kind of every year. I'd love to get some tips from you or or just hear from you how do you protect these beautiful plants from bugs and and all these other things that could end up destroying your your crop um i'll talk to it a little bit you know it's hard for me to talk about that kind of stuff just because i got the bryceland forest farms and the whitethorn valley farms that really are true regenerative closed loop farmers that really understand the um the way it all works but you know taking from and learning from them really have incorporated all kinds of different um plants and flowers and beneficials um around that really attract some of the good bugs around to the areas where your plants are that really take care of any kind of pests or insects that you might have so we don't spray one thing and and growing different uh different cultivars like Paradise Punch and the Whitethorn Rose, their terpene profile is so pungent that those terpenes actually repel a lot yes. of the bugs that some of my OGs or some of those other strains that I used to grow, used to get all the time. I don't have that problem with these. Paradise Punch, I could stick in, in Whitethorn Rose, I could stick it in a, a grow room or in an area full of powdery mildew it will not get powdery mildew so it's it it has within it some resistant to powdery mildew and it just makes it a pleasure not to have to really battle that or deal with it i know people that are always spraying and and dealing with that kind of stuff but i i feel very fortunate to have a strain or multiple of strains that really repel bugs with the terpene profile and, and and powdery mildews and and bud rot and all that kind of stuff yeah that's great. Yeah, I know um, the the lesson that you had at the beginning of the show in terms of finding strains that work for your area, that was something that JR and I talked a lot about uh, this past Emerald Cup because I had just gone through this experience where I had this beautiful plant. It was a blueberry cookies cross that had this beautiful branches full of giant buds and I had to throw the whole thing in the compost bin because it just got full of mold and that's where you know JR when and I when we were hanging out at this past Emerald Cup we were talking about you know yeah I've got to find strains that work well outside I can't just like you know grab something that sounds or looks great or whatever it is I've got to work with something that works with uh you know where I live you know, what's going to be unique about that paradise pine and you should start to expect it is I, I'm pretty sure that that will harvest around mid September, or early September. So probably quite a bit earlier than you're used to. So a lot of times when, you know, rains come and that humidity changes, you know, different cultivars get start to get powdery mildew or bud rot. You can avoid a lot of those problems by having a strain that you can actually harvest a little earlier. So I think you're going to find that you're really going to like it. I think the things that you're describing me too about it that's really interesting is uh, the PM resistance is one part of it, but I'm betting that citrus and those terpenes that maybe we don't all know about also play a huge fact in the natural repellent of the insects and stuff. So that could just be like a holy grail for your microclimate. Yeah, right. I should... You just gave me a great idea. I should find a way to kind of extract some of those um, juices out of the plant and we can make a spray. Look, we'll go partners, all of us. Oh, that'd be we'll, awesome. We'll, you can spray your plants with the white thorn rose juice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just well, I'd spray it on my body. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, um, let's see. So if you guys have been having a great time today, I know I have, and you have been, you want to maybe check out some of the strains that John's been talking about today. Like I said, go to tangledrootsstore.com. Johnny's got a few different strains up here. He's got Don Patrol, which is Paradise Punch, uh, sorry, Paradise Punch uh, times Runs times Zookies. 
He's got Daydreamer, which is Paradise Punch times Margie's Magic, which is one of his strains. He's got um, Forbidden Paradise, which is Paradise Punch times Runts. And then, of course, uh, we've got the Paradise Pine, uh, which was the Paradise Punch times White Thorn Rose. He's got Paradise Punch times Skittles, which is Huckleberries. Man, you've got so many different options. Margie's Magic. They're all up on TangledRootsStore.com. Uh, so make sure to check it out and grow the magic in your neck of the woods because you know it's going to be dank. And then, of course, uh, check out PickHumboldt.com. That's P-I-C-K-H-U-M-B-O-L-D-T.com. PickHumboldt.com is the Huckleberry Hill Farms website. Um, and then also you guys are on Instagram. It's at Huckleberry Hill Farms, all one word. Is that right, John? Yes, it is. And and I really want to encourage your listeners. And if you haven't, Sam, I'd be very surprised if you haven't watched the new newly released documentary that Bovida um, just put out. I think it's on their their site or you can go to YouTube and punch in um, Humboldt Legacy or something like that. And it's with Ridgeline Farms, Mood Made Farms, Canada Country and myself. And it's it, it gets very emotional and it's very educational and, and you'll learn a lot about the where this multi-billion dollar industry was created. So that's a good watch if you have like a 30 minute free time. Oh yeah, it's really great. And then also uh, shout out to John's partner, <laughs> Rose. Rose is, is uh, great. She's, um, you know, when you go to events like John was talking about, he takes time to go meet his customers. So that's how I met him. Originally, he came down to the San Francisco Bay Area at uh, Seven Stars in Richmond. He's also come down to, uh, what was it, uh, the Bright Spot in Fairfield in NorCal. Um, and so uh, I wanted to shout out your partner, Rose, because she's always great. And then uh, any other shout outs or any other plugs, websites or whatever that people should check out or, or that you want to plug before we go? I think you covered it. I mean, this was an absolute pleasure. And um, I just, anybody have any questions that maybe they think of afterwards, they're more than welcome to DM me. I'm always up at 4.30 in the morning and I love to, to chat with, with people that love this plant. So feel free, you're not bothering me. And this is really why we do what we do is uh, to interact with you and, and, and people that like, like the plant. So other than the Emerald Cup, what are some of the events uh, that people can find you at and come shake your hand? You know, it's probably going to be the Emerald Cup this year. Um, you know, it, it's really hard to get away. And that's what kind of my struggle with the amount of time and free time is because this plant really demands a lot of a lot of attention. And, it, yeah, it you know, I noticed whenever I try to leave for a couple of days, I'm really opening the door for for something to happen. And I don't want something to happen. I mean, this is this is my time and our time to shine and to share what we've been doing for a long time. So I don't want anything to happen to the plants while I'm gone. So if they want to shake their hand, they got to come up to the farm. Come, come to the farm. Them. I'd love to take you around. Um, Shelter Cove's right over the mountain. So, you know, bring your wife, bring your girlfriend, bring your friends. And uh, it's really a magical experience. And uh, we can really talk some good talk here. That's so awesome. Well, we had such a good time. Everyone in the chat was throwing in hearts. Uh, Lfunk415 said, this guy is a gem. Uh, Crazy Pop I Mom. Love that guy. <laughs> 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 Crazy Pop Mom put a bunch of hearts in the chat. Uh, Canterbridge, uh, Canterbridge said, thanks for the sesh in the chat. Um, so many, so a lot of love for the interview today. Um, so Johnny, thank you so much. We'll have to touch base again with you soon. Good luck at the Emerald cup. I didn't realize there's going to be so many different form factors of, uh, of your product. So that's really cool. And then, um, of course we'll stay in touch, but, uh, as always support your local grower, support local growers like Johnny. And as always, uh, Jr. Growers love everyone. Growers love. Hey, and 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 last thing, uh, Sam, uh, to end it, if you gave me an address, I'll send you like maybe five of our new white thorn rose shirts, and you can give them out to your listeners as you know if you have a contest or you you see fit. All right. You have well, big boy sizes. I got all kinds of sizes. You'll get one. I can send. DM me and I'll I'll send you one. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we'll figure something out, listeners. Uh, stay tuned. We'll figure something out. 
Uh, thank you so much for hanging out with us as always. Shout out to Grove Bags. Thank you guys for your support. Use the code Cannabuzz for a discount on your order. Cure your weed so that it tastes good and smells good. And then, of course, go to TikiMadman.com, TikiSeeds.com, and uh, Neptune, right? Neptune. Let me get Seed that bank. URL. Oh, NeptuneSeedBank.com. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Growers love. Growers love. Love you.